Hello and welcome at Book Lovers Companion. My name is Edith and right next to me is my lovely co-host, The Chattering Teacup. Hello. And here with us again, a guest from across the pond, action author, action thriller author, Avanti Centre. Hello and welcome at Book Lovers Companion. Hello and thank you so much for having me. I love your, your beautiful podcast. It's so much fun. Oh, thank you. That's quite a compliment. Yes, the way you roll your R's to get it started just sets the stage for a good time. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she always says. I'm overly traumatic. <laughs> it's fun. Why not? <laughs> Indeed, and we want to have fun. So let's dive into your only recently published book, Cleopatra's Vendetta. It came out in November this year. And it is a standalone. You have an ensemble cast of characters. And I said so before I hit the record button, it's quite a scary book. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about the plot? No no spoilers, of course, but what can they expect when they buy your book? Yeah, so they can expect a nail-biting, page-turning experience. Um, you know, that's that's my first goal with any novel is to is to entertain people. Um, the scary part I think you're alluding to is the fact that there's this um, this ancient cult mm -hmm. that wants to control the the hearts and mind of the world, and they've been succeeding for thousands of years to influence public perception. The story starts on Cleopatra's last day. She's waiting for her spy to show up and hopefully give her some good news because uh, she and Mark Anthony have just suffered a horrid defeat to her mortal enemy, Octavian, who heads up this fictional cult that I have created. And Mark Anthony has killed himself and she is about to do the same, but her spy shows up and he has finally found the location of Octavian and his cult. And it's an island, but it's not where they thought it was. And so she tells him to go hide the location of the island along with some other things that she has hidden for posterity. Um, so she's hoping that she will get you know, her final revenge against Octavian by hiding the location of his stronghold. Um, so she kills herself. And thousands of years later, uh, we are in Italy with uh, Tim and Angie Stryker. And they're a, a power couple. He heads up a special ops organization with the Futures Command. And she is a self-made CEO. She's um, doing biofuels and trying to help the world, uh, you know, with climate change. And on the surface, they're a happy family. They have a four-year-old daughter, but underneath they've been uh, dealing with the grief of the loss of their, their infant son. He was just a year old when he died. And as many couples um, face, uh, they just don't know how to deal with the loss of their son. And so they've been fighting. And to uh, they recognize that they haven't been getting along. So they take a holiday to Bari, Italy, to try to kiss and make up. And while they're there, Stryker gets called off on a mission and he knows it must be important because his director wouldn't pull him off, you know, this holiday unless it was, but there's been a string of global assassinations. So we have a little bit of a mission impossible thing going on here where Stryker's trying to stop this. All of these world leaders have been being assassinated and nobody knows why. So he and his buddy Ray go off and try to stop the assassination of a Saudi prince. And they fail. That happens in the first chapter. While he's gone, his wife, Angie, goes out with the girls. They go out to lunch and then uh, they decide to go get an icy cold beverage at the local Italian bar. And while they're there, um, a group of handsome strangers buy them a couple of drinks. Mm. Mistake, because the bartender mm. puts some roofies in the drinks. And so Angie and their four-year-old daughter and two of her best friends get kidnapped. And so the story just starts from there. So Stryker needs to find out, you know, where have they gone? Who has kidnapped them and why? And he shortly discovers that there's a link to Cleopatra. Um, and he, you know, is completely mystified as to what this possible link might be, what the kidnappers might have an interest in Cleopatra. Well, it turns out that uh, they're trying to find her treasure and Stryker has to find her treasure as well in order to figure out where Angie's located. And Angie, being a powerful CEO, while she's being held captive, is trying to figure out how to escape. So that's kind of the story mm -hmm. in a nutshell. Yeah. And we wanted to ask you about, I uh, said, 
a sample cast because it's more than one main character, like you just mentioned, in introducing us to the plot. We call it, we usually call it a solo cast. Uh, you said, Teacup, it's a sort of um, group of misfits, a little a little bit at least. I mean, it's it's not what you... They call would, themselves misfits. Yeah, they call so, themselves mi misfits. I, I mean, and it's also not what you would usually expect from such a group who work for the US government. Well, what, what we right. would not suspect. That's right. Yeah, I had a lot of fun putting this uh, this cast of misfits together. You know, so often in fiction, you know, the the heroes are you know perfectly baked. You know, they're all gorgeous and they have <laughs> no warts whatsoever, and they're brilliant and they can you know hit a speeding bullet you know at thirty <laughs> miles an hour with their eyes closed and and so I wanted um, a cast that was a little more realistic. And so you've got Striker. And And he leads this team of misfits and he has OCD um, from a trauma that happened when he was young. His father was an alcoholic and came home one day and killed um, Stryker's mom and his sister. And he tried to kill Stryker. He just succeeded in knocking off one of his fingers. So Stryker uh, has this, you know, very deep traumatic wound from this experience. And he's, um, you know, he deals with anger and he uses meditation to try to keep he's a, he's a, a redhead um and you know as um redheads often are he's he's prone to just blowing his top so he really has to work um, especially when his wife and baby daughter are kidnapped he really has to control his emotions so you've got his his journey and then his um, best friend and partner ray has ptsd mm -hmm. and he deals with nightmares And he has an enhanced sense of smell and hearing that would have normally kept him probably from, you know, this type of career. But after 9-11 uh, in, in my fictional world, um, their leadership realized that people could have gifts and not be perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Sam is Angie's sister, and she is the most charming woman you can possibly imagine. So they send her in kind of as a seductress, and uh, she loves that. You know, she absolutely gets off on being able to seduce men and women. Um, she can't commit to any sort of relationship to save her soul. She um, gambles and gambles a little bit too much. So she has her own warts and flaws as well. And they're um, one of the Their co-workers uh, used to be a Navy fighter pilot, mm -hmm. and she lost the use mm -hmm. of her legs. And uh, their director um, is gay. Uh, she's gay before, um, in her mind, before it was hip, before it was hip to be gay. So she's <laughs> learned to, um, you know, kind of hide under the under the shadows. Yeah. She's a sort of Meryl Streep character uh -huh. um, who rips her glasses off, you know, <laughs> off her face at the slightest provocation. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> A, a quite interesting cast of, of misfits. They call themselves the M2 team because they are, um, they recognize that they're, you know, works in progress. Mm -hmm. And the whole book, I wonder, what, i what is it with these um, brotherhoods, ancient brotherhoods and conspiracy theories that fascinate us so much? That's a great question. I think that many of us recognize that there are forces going on that, perhaps are beyond our visible purview. And I think that is part of what fascinates me about conspiracies and fascinates a lot of readers about conspiracies and ancient cults. You know, we, we know from uh, just from history that uh, there have been a number of, you know, real life mm -hmm. cults. And to this day, there are fascinating cults that uh, the news illuminates with various lawsuits and the like. I'm thinking of a recent example in Los Angeles. But I think that there's, I don't know, as a, as a human being, um, I'm always fascinated with secrets and things that are are going on behind the curtain. And and I've been in, in positions of leadership as well and uh, in my um, prior career. And there's things that that in a position of leadership, you can't tell, right? Mm -hmm. So our political leaders, um, for the safety of the country, 
uh, can't always share everything that's going on. And I think that we as humans, we want to know, you know, we're fascinated by secrets and, and what's really going on. And the one, there's a couple themes in this novel. And one of them is about propaganda. So Mm -hmm. the cult was a perfect antagonist for this idea of uh, bringing in the history of propaganda into the story and uh, talking about how um, propaganda. uh, One thing I didn't realize until I started researching the novel was that Cleopatra was primarily defeated because of the propaganda that uh, war that Octavian waged against her and Mark Anthony. He put up all these leaflets and, uh, posters and the like to make her out to look like a, a harlot mm-hmm. um, and, uh, you know, queen of the devil and and all of this. And so propaganda has been underway for thousands of years being used um, in military campaigns even. And, you know, to, to bring it back to your question, I think that, um, you know, it's 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 useful and enlightening to think about, you know, the different groups that mm-hmm. might be trying to influence our, our thinking. So mm-hmm. this this cult was a, a perfect vehicle to, to mm-hmm. do that. Mm-hmm. And as you mentioned, propaganda, where do you think is the, does like um, advertisement or public relation turn into propaganda? Oh. Where's the point? Yeah, it's it's maybe a spectrum, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because one person's truth is another person's lies. And the way I see it is on this spectrum, you've got public relations and marketing, which, you know, I do and most small businesses do. But that's more awareness and mm-hmm. and sharing what you have as a product, right? You know, hey, I've got this, this great book and these people have said all these really neat things about it. And If you're looking for this type of book, right, if you're seeking a Da Vinci Code meets Mission Impossible type of story or something along those lines, you know, click here and and check it out. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's nothing uh, deceitful about that. And uh, people can go and they can look and see the good reviews and the bad reviews. I think where it really becomes propagandized is where people are sharing things that they know are, are outright lies. Right. And where they're uh, perhaps using um, deceitful ways of sharing that information. So, you know, one of the things that we've been seeing here in America, and perhaps you've been seeing it there in Vienna as well, is artificial intelligence, Mm -hmm. um, uh, social media profiles who are sharing things about, you know, one side of the political spectrum or the other. And they're they're not even real people. Yeah. They're sharing things that are known to be false. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're not factual at mm-hmm. all. And I think that's, you know, the far, far end of the of the spectrum. Um, so, you know, truth is a little bit of a, a liquid thing, right? Because mm-hmm. there's two sides to every yeah. coin. And you can say, you know, this coin is heads. Yeah. Well, that's partly true, you know. Because the coin also has tails as well. Mm. You know, the glass is half full and half Mm. empty. So I think it's up to each of us to figure out, because we all get a chance to decide whether we want to believe the glass is half full or empty um, or just appreciate the glass. And Mm. so that's, you know, kind of what I'm trying to encourage people to do in this novel is to check their sources, think Mm -hmm. for themselves and try to figure out where the information Mm -hmm. that they're getting falls on that spectrum you know yeah. is it an outright lie that somebody's mm-hmm. telling trying to make me do something or is it uh you know uh, an innocent black friday sale that is you know making me aware that there's a pair of jeans that you know i might want to pick up while they're on sale yeah. so so that's my thought yeah you're also mentioning um deep fakes mm. in your book so um fakes. how is um a regular person mm. supposed to decide what's true and what's not if there is so much technology behind it to make Mm -hmm. it seem real Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah this technology of of deep fakes has really exploded in the last couple of years and i think uh, one of the things that we saw on twitter at least before a few weeks ago is that although there were deep fake videos uh, there were also people um, letting you know that this was a deep fake video and the technology 
um, I think uh, up to now has been somewhat um, expensive. And there are, what's interesting is that the technology to identify the deep fakes is growing at the same level as the technology to create the deep fakes. So there's artificial intelligence now that can look at a video to look at it almost bit by bit, you know, Mm -hmm. to see if it's Mm -hmm. been digitally altered. Um, So I think that that's, you know, nice. Um, I think, you know, as individuals, I think that, you know, if we see our friend, someone we trust post a video on Facebook of, you know, the meal they had last night or, you know, they went somewhere. So I think we have to look at the the source of the video. You know, is it is it a trustworthy source? Is it um, is it a news outlet that is committed to journalistic principles? Is it or is it um, from news outlets that are known to be somewhat sensationalistic? So I think, you know, as individuals, we all have to look at the source of the information and we can also research, yeah. you know, um, not just take it at face value, mm-hmm. but we can, you know, if it's something that's completely outlandish, then, you know, we can research and see, you know, OK, so is that is the same story being picked up by major news outlets? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. that's what they're paid to do. You know, yeah. they're paid to verify this kind of information. If it's something that's just, uh, you know, Elvis is walking among us, right? <laughs> um, then, you know what? It, it's probably, even though I see that video of Elvis walking, it's probably not true, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I think there's some simple things that we can all do to, you know, be judicious about what we yeah. decide to believe and yeah. what we decide is probably false propaganda. Mm. Um, so there's still hope for us. Oh. There's hope. Absolutely. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the whole idea for the book, especially the, the plot, like you mentioned, this cult thing that you invented. And when was the point when you thought, oh, I have an idea or was it a certain event that triggered the idea for this book? I had the idea of Tim and Angie first hmm. and And they're they're arguing and dealing with the loss of their son. Mm -hmm. And from there, the way that I write, and it might be different, you know, I saw that you have a novel might be different than the way that you write. But for me, it's a it's a layering on process. I have, you know, some initial idea, you know, in this case, it was, oh, wow, that is some great conflict. You know, a husband and a wife you know, mm-hmm. losing their infant son. And then, you know, and then she gets kidnapped. And so then it was a layering on, you know, it's like, okay, so who kidnaps her? Is it just, you know, a, a single person, you know, that kidnaps her? Or is it a group? Oh, yeah, it could be, you know, <laughs> it could be a group. That would be kind of interesting. And then, you know, I layer that on with, all right, so who's the leader of the group? And you know, how sick and twisted can I make him? And, <laughs> and what are, what's their motivations? And then, you know, and I also like to to think about that, you know, theme up front too, you know, the, the theme of, you know, truth and, and lies. And, you know, so then it was like, okay, so what's their motivation? All right. So they could, you know, they could be spreading this worldwide propaganda. And then somewhere along the way, I think the the idea that I had that um, was really kind of the one that made the story was because I had had intended it to be just sort of a, a present day, you know, kind of a typical thriller, you know, mm-hmm. more Mission Impossible mm-hmm. kind of thing. But then I got kind of bored with it, you know, <laughs> as like, this is like every other book out there. This is just kind of boring. And I was like, all right, I need, I need a historical figure here to, to really make this more interesting. And then I hit upon the idea of using Cleopatra and it just kind of all tied together. And I had the idea and then I went and researched her, mm. you know, because just because I have the idea doesn't mean she's going to fit. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. But um, so I bought a couple of biographies and the more I researched, the more I was like, oh, this is perfect. And then it just kind of dovetailed. And next thing you know, I had the whole outline and was, you know, pounding out the story. Um, So for me, it it builds Mm -hmm. and I take and I have some ideas along the way that that don't work. Mm. The first draft of the story 
um, had as one of the antagonists um, a young man that was born as an intersex character. Mm -hmm. And his family had chosen him to be male Mm -hmm. because they aren't very fond of women. Um, But he inside was really more of a woman. Mm -hmm. Um, But this this didn't land well with my beta readers. I have uh, equally as many men as women readers, and the male readers just cringed and clutched their privates every time <laughs> you know they were giving me feedback. Um, and uh, and I also didn't want the story to be just about that. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's an important topic, and was interested in in researching um, how many people there are in the world that are born with both sets of genitalia. So it was a fascinating topic mm-hmm. to research. And it would have fit in with the story, but it it had the wrong emotional reaction. So yeah. that was mm-hmm. one of the the ideas that um, that I had that I had to had mm-hmm. to throw out. Mm-hmm. Do you think you might come back to that idea at at one point in another book, maybe? Uh, perhaps it's. Uh, I think it's a, an interesting topic, but uh, you never know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But how long did it take you to get a? good idea of Cleopatra, her time and her struggle against Octavian and the whole Egypt versus Rome angle? Um, You know, it took a while. I think I read um, one or two biographies and it's tempting when I'm researching a novel to deep dive into that. And there are just volumes written about Cleopatra and Rome and what was going on at the time. And But the story is mostly in in present tense, mm. and so I, I really had to had to pull myself back from spending <laughs> too much time um, in in that world. Even though I was just oh wow, and then they did this, and who knows what they what else they did, and and they actually think they might have found her tomb, and that's yeah. fascinating as well. And so I don't know. I maybe spent um, you know two or three weeks digging mm-hmm. into Cleopatra. Mm-hmm. But then I had to pull myself out and say, all right, <laughs> we're, you know, there's, there's a lot more to do here, you know, to get to the, the finished end product, you know, so it's, it's a trick to, to research and include just enough to, to make the story and the reader feel mm. like they're immersed, but yep. to not put so much there, you know, it's, it's not a story set in Egypt. It's yep. a, it's a, modern day story with links to ancient Egypt. Mm, mm. And you you take us to quite a lot of different places. Did you visit all those different places? Because you said we start in Egypt, we went to Italy, we went to India, we went to Greece. Saudi Arabia? Yeah, Saudi Arabia. Sorry, I forgot that as well. You know, I've been to many of them. Uh, when I got to um, visit uh, your hometown of uh, Vienna, I um, had the experience of being able to travel all over Europe. And uh, but no, I haven't made it to all of them. But I feel like I've I've traveled enough to know the types of things that make a place unique. Mm-hmm. So Saudi Arabia, for instance, I I have not visited there, mm-hmm. but um, was able to do enough research mm-hmm. that um, the people, my readers that have been there say it, it feels like I got it right. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's, I, I appreciate that. And I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to do all of the traveling that I have, mm-hmm. because I think it really adds a, a layer of authenticity mm-hmm. and being able to, to know the types of things to, to research, you know, about a place, you know, kind of like Things like what does the air feel like, mm-hmm. you know, or what are the what are the smells, or what's the unique, um, what are, what's the unique food, and uh, what's and I also um, when I meet people, um, it's kind of fun to see if they've traveled to any of these places. So I was at a party once when I was working on the Doomsday Medallion, and I met somebody who had recently been to Turkey, mm-hmm. and I had um, a couple of scenes set in Turkey, and I said, well. Tell me some things that's, you know, different about uh, Turkey from your travels. And they said, well, you know, they serve olives with breakfast. And that was kind of interesting. And they said, oh, and all these guys go there for um, plastic surgery. 
all these balding men go there for hair transplants. And I said, you're <laughs> kidding. And he said, no, it's this, it's this weird phenomenon that all these men from Europe go to Turkey for hair transplants. So I put that little tidbit in there yeah. in, in that chapter. And uh, I recently saw a, a story the other day on social media about all these men going to Turkey for <laughs> hair transplants. And I've had people call that out. You know, how did you know that? Well, you know, I just, paid attention and met somebody that happened to be there, you know, so if you, if, you know, there's other aspiring authors out there that can interview somebody who has been or recently been, if you can't go yourself, I think yeah. that's another way of being able to pull in some of those realistic tidbits. Yeah. But again, you can't go too deep, right? You know, because you yeah. got to keep the story moving, yeah. the action flowing. Yeah. But if you can add in a couple of those details, then it just really feels like you're there. Mm -hmm. It's it's always um, a question of how much put, to put in there and how much to leave out, isn't it? It is. Yeah. I wanted to ask you how organized are you? I mean, you just said there was a lot of research. You came across a lot of interesting points and information. And how organized are you in your writing or in your planning? Sometimes a little too much, I think. <laughs> you know, there's people that are pantsers and there's mm. people that are plotters. And I'm definitely a plotter. Mm. Uh, with all of my stories, I, I definitely like to have an outline. And that's because in, in life as well as in writing, I find that if you start with the end in mind, yep. you're a lot more likely to get to the end yep. <laughs> instead of getting sidetracked along the way. Yep. I mean, it's fun to be sidetracked. It's just like, you know, if you're planning a trip to Australia, if you don't keep in mind that you're going to Australia, you could end up in New Zealand, which would be great fun. Um, but if you're really wanting to see Ayers Rock in, in Australia, you have to keep that in mind. So subplots are fun. Um, but I like, uh, you know, throwing in the, the red herrings and the twists. And, you know, Solstice Shadows, one of my Van Ops novels, has just this amazing twist that if I hadn't known what that twist was going to be at the the end of the novel, I couldn't have laid all of this groundwork along the way. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely have pretty extensive outlines to where um, when I sit down to write a chapter, really what I'm adding is details about that particular place and the dialogue. But I know the main conflict for that chapter. You know, I know the outcome of that chapter. I, I've already got my uh, my characters um, and their personalities identified. So so I, I plan and organize quite a bit ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And the book seems quite organized too because there are let's say quite short chapters and we with each chapter we jump from one scene to another uh, place and it yep. makes it very fast paced because of that and you mm -hmm. always want to read on mm -hmm. and, and it's like in, in in films you jump from one scene to the next and back again mm -hmm. yeah I, uh, when i'm writing it's almost like i'm seeing the movie you uh, know yeah. unfold yeah, yeah. I know and, what you mean. Uh, you know, when I have my outline done, I'm I'm seeing it play out like like a movie um, in my head. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of people that just write in one character's point of view, and and that works as well for so many books. But for me, I like the added tension mm -hmm. that I can bring to the story by having, for instance, the bad guy's perspective, or even um, like Tim and Angie. You know. He's trying to find her and she's, you know, stuck in this cell and the, the tension that, that you have from being able to go back and forth between mm -hmm. their varying points of view, because she knows things that he doesn't and he knows things that she doesn't. And so as a, as a reader, you're, you're knowing it all and you're just like, oh, I yes. can't wait for her to figure this out or, oh. When's he gonna get that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I find that uh, you can really ratchet up the tension and, and make it more of a page turner yeah. by yeah. having multiple points of view. And yes, you have to have a lot of that planned out ahead of time. But I find that I also need to be open to ideas as they come while I'm mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. And and that's uh, you know that's a trick too. It's like um, oh you know here I am pounding away and oh gosh I you know didn't know that about my character <laughs> you know or whatever. And as long as it fits in with their mm -hmm. overall yeah. personality um it's it's a lot of fun that yeah. discovery process as uh -huh. you're writing mm -hmm. yeah so that that's where the the fun comes in too that and i just really like the putting the 
the twists and the puzzle parts together and having it all kind of come together at the end, that to me is just so much fun. Yeah. And was there ever a point, either in this book or in the others, when your character was looking over your shoulder and said, mm, come on, what are you doing to me? Not that. <laughs> I'm not sure. I my my characters don't get quite that personified. Okay. You know, I know many <laughs> authors have that experience yeah. where they feel like their character is sitting on their shoulder. My mine don't um, don't talk to me in quite the same way. <laughs> yeah. They, um, they 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 definitely um you know, it's it's more like my muse or my subconscious definitely comes up with some ideas and uh you know, some of the characters, you know, I've written three books in the Van Op series and um Maddie Will and Bear are are pretty real to me now but mm -hmm. uh they're um i wouldn't necessarily say that they're talking over my shoulder mm -hmm. so you're still the boss <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, still the boss. you said there are a lot of themes and topics in your book in this one i suppose in the others as well is there anything as a writer you would never touch upon mm -hmm. aside from killing dogs of course which is oh, a no, 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 don't, don't like killing any of the pets. And, uh, you know, I, I don't like, you know, killing children either, mm -hmm. you know, the, in some of my books, uh, children definitely are in danger, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, I think there's a, a good versus evil thing going on in my books. I've, I've covered some pretty touchy topics, you know, sex trafficking mm -hmm. is a topic yep. in this book. Yep. You know, there's some, you know, my books aren't, uh, like erotic. So some mm -hmm. of all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't really fit. And, uh, if there's any kind of, you know, torture sort of stuff, mm -hmm. it's, it's off screen, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. where it's, mm -hmm. it's yeah. happened, but you know, we're dealing more with like the aftermath. Mm -hmm. So yeah. in this novel, for instance, one of our characters is actually whipped by yep you know, the commandant, the head of the yep. cult, but we don't see it happen. And we're definitely not in her perspective yep. when it happens. So I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm game for kind of whatever the story uh, requires, yep. but I'm also sensitive to, you know, I'm, I'm not doing violence just for the sake of yep. violence. And As a matter of fact, my first three novels, Maddie, Maddie Marshall, she's into nonviolence. She's mm -hmm. an Aikido mm -hmm. expert with some special martial mm -hmm. arts abilities. And, you know, everybody around her is, you know, much more shoot 'em up, bang, bang. And she's <laughs> like, you know, why can't we all get along? Can't we bring this to a peaceful <laughs> resolution? You know, Aikido yeah. Yeah. is all about using their energy against themselves to bring back a peaceful resolution. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so I think um, sex trafficking, for instance, is an important topic. It, yep. That was another one that was um, kind of gut wrenching to research. But I'm, uh, you know, uh, like we said in the beginning, uh, my aim is for my books to be entertaining. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, um, you know, if I can raise a little bit of awareness about mm -hmm. sex trafficking and, uh, you know, encourage people to be safe while they're traveling yep. and some of that, uh, but they're, they're meant to be fun. Yeah. Um, so I think to answer your question, anything that's, um, you know, uh, doesn't serve a purpose for the theme or the yep. story or isn't fun yep. would not be something that would, would be in my story. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of, uh, spy technology in the mm -hmm. book mm -hmm. and I want to, How we do both these... wonder, actually, don't we? Yeah. How do these microphones work? Uh, the ones, the ones in the in, in the moment, in the also teeth. in on this <laughs> sub vocal microphone. Yeah. I mean, if do they whisper or because if they speak, I guess they would be yeah. heard by someone. Yeah, I've I've never actually used one, but my <laughs> understanding is that they're um, so. For those who haven't read the book, what we're talking about is um, they're called molar mm. microphones. This is real technology that our military uses. Okay. Um, and my understanding is that they take a cast of the teeth uh -huh. so that the microphone fits like on top of the teeth. Uh -huh. So it's almost like you're wearing um, braces or like a night guard or something. Uh -huh. okay. So you've got okay. this thing over a couple of your molars. And then it, it uses bone conducting technology to transmit the sound as well as You know, you're, it's almost like you're hearing in your ear, mm -hmm. um, is my understanding. And it's, they say it's, it's a, a sub vocalization. So mm -hmm. it's like, I think less than a whisper. 
uh-huh. um, okay. to, to speak into it. So I think it would probably be something that, um, you know, if, if you were going to say something and you were reading a newspaper, you might, you know, uh, you know, bring the newspaper kind of up close to your face or, you know, you could, um, you know, act like you're taking a drink and, you know, sub vocalize or, you know, whisper into mm-hmm. your microphone. Mm-hmm. But it's fascinating technology. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And also the silicon masks, because I was, a uh, They were there every time, and they got new ones. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Is, cool. is is this real? I mean, real stuff. It is. Yeah, okay. they they definitely have um, silicone masks, and okay. you know we've been seeing them in the Mission Impossible movies yeah, for yeah. a couple of Mission yeah. Impossible movies, right? Where you know one of the heroes or one of the bad guys rips the silicone yeah. mask off. But uh, yes, they are very real, and they take a mold of the face, and they uh, they come down to chest level, mm-hmm. right, or lower. So okay. you know, a guy who is changing his hair color from dark to blonde could have like blonde chest hair in his you yeah. know silicone mask type thing and uh yeah they can you know fit right over the head and mold to the features and they can you know change the features slightly you know as well and with all of the surveillance that's going on these days people are yeah. absolutely wearing them and um, okay. especially in our, our covert you know government agencies mm-hmm. I think they've been perfecting and, and wearing yeah. them for some time. Yeah. You know, you can even get one, you know, on the internet just as a regular citizen. You can get them now. Um, okay. But, yeah. But I guess the structure, the bone structure of the head would have to be similar. That's where you use the mold, oh. right? So I think that they, you know, have a way to take a mold of your of your head. Oh. And then, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm sure that. The more expensive versions, you know, have a, a way to map your your head. Mm-hmm. Um, who knows? Maybe they even use lasers, you know, to to map your your head and face, mm-hmm. so that you change your your hair color and you know your you know make your nose a little longer, your cheekbones mm-hmm. a little wider, or mm-hmm. your face a little you know your chin a little more pointed, or you know all of those things to to hide in plain sight. So okay. you can never be sure whom you're talking to. No, it's me. Just saying, you know, <laughs> no yeah. worries. Never become a show. <laughs> yeah. Try to rip it off. Oh, <laughs> no, no, it's not working. <laughs> it's really me. May I ask you about the mindset of your characters? What I mean is, I read on your website that your father was a Marine mm-hmm. and that he also worked in different kind of missions mm, similar to theirs. How did it help you uh, to get the mindset of these characters right Yeah, that's interesting. So my dad was in military intelligence, but he never talked about it. So oh, okay. I was, and he passed away a number of years ago. So I've been somewhat limited in being able to pick his brain. But uh, here's a funny little thing about me that I don't talk about much is I have dreams all the time that I'm in some sort of action oriented situation where I'm being shot at or someone's trying to stab me or I'm having to disarm someone or my gun's not working or, and I'm this, you know, peace loving, meditating, Zen kind of person. And I have all of these dreams and usually I'm kicking ass um, in, in these dreams. So usually the bad guys aren't getting the best of me, but I've done research as well. Um, Uh, because dreams only go so mm, far, yeah. right? So I've read, um, you know, a number of memoirs and, you know, and have immersed myself mm. in, the, in the genre as well, right? So uh, I think um, between my own internal experiences and I have interviewed some, you know, people who have been in the military as well. Um, so, you know, my, the feedback that I've gotten is that, you uh, It seems like I'm I'm hitting the nail mm-hmm, on the proverbial mm-hmm. head there, and mm-hmm. um, you know many military men and women appreciate mm-hmm. my novels. So mm-hmm. again, I'm I'm trying to I'm I'm not writing novels that um, are you know fully military, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. you know in their nature. Mine are more character driven, where the protagonist or one of the other protagonists, you know, this is is their their career, but they're real people mm-hmm. with real issues mm-hmm. and they're not obsessed with the style of gun that they have, you know, unless they're a bad guy petting their sniper rifle or something. But, you know, again, it's about the the level of detail for this type of 
of book and mm -hmm. it's not uh, it's not the the hardcore military espionage mm -hmm. um it's it's not fully true to life um <laughs> you know i think that um in in reality you know so in from my understanding in in real life you've got um you've got officers who are what we would think of as you know sort of secret agents cia mm -hmm. agents who are trying to turn people for information mm -hmm. and then you've got covert ops mm -hmm. warriors who are more the guys who go in in the middle of the night and mm -hmm. do the assassinations and mine are kind of a merging of the two mm -hmm. Right. Where it's mm -hmm. kind of almost like uh, historians or uh, computer geeks mm -hmm. with with mm -hmm. guns mm -hmm. um, who are more out trying to gather information or, you know, save the wife kind of thing rather than um, just the covert warriors. There's some um, of my author friends who do that, you know, subgenre really, yeah. really well. Mm -hmm. But that's but there's that subgenre usually doesn't have a whole lot of character growth. Mm -hmm. And so if um, the reader is really into all of the military technology and the military strategy, you know, that's a little bit further on that spectrum. Mm -hmm. You know, mine is much lighter on mm -hmm. the military technology and much stronger on character growth. And I do that because I feel like for me as a reader, I get a lot more emotional uh, reaction and investment in characters that mm -hmm. I know. Yep. And on some of those, you know, super military novels, I can't even keep all their names straight, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, and, and you, you know. If you don't have more specialized knowledge as a reader, you can't follow all the yep. weapons and military equipment anyway. Yeah, exactly. Uh, psychology also plays an important part in this book because your characters have to get into the mind or in the mindset of not just their opponents, but also, I mean, Sam has to get into the mind of Cleopatra to find the clues or, or find their way to Angie. Yeah. So how yeah, important? I'm, I mean, it is important. And, and it is important. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, psychology has always been a fascination for me. I, I love it. Um, so it's it's a lot of fun to bring that into the book. And and um, yeah, so Sam, who is part of Stryker's team and Angie's sister, is just as desperate as Stryker yeah. to get her baby sister back. And she's, you know, got this idea that, you uh, you know, Cleopatra may have, you know, hidden this gold journal somewhere. They've, they're pretty much on this wild goose chase yep. to try to find a journal. And so Sam is reading everything that she can get her hands on to try to get yep. in Cleopatra's head. And the things that she learned help her solve the, the puzzle. And the bad guys have been trying to find uh, the same stuff and for thousands of years, but they have underestimated Cleopatra and they've never tried to get in Cleopatra's head. Yep. So they didn't know what to look for. Yeah. Um, so absolutely, <laughs> psychology yeah. is is essential. And, and the the character arcs of both Stryker and Angie, you know, are they going to get back together? They were talking, the divorce word yep. came up yep. in, in the fight that they had the night before all of this happens. So they have to um, do some soul searching uh, in order to figure out, you know, can this marriage be saved? Should the marriage be saved? Do we want the marriage to be saved? Mm. So you've got that dramatic question going on at the same time. So yeah. it's a it's a rich, richly yeah. textured story yeah. with a lot going on. Exactly, yeah. they learn a lot about themselves, don't they? Striker mm -hmm. as well as Angie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you about life under the poor. Of course, since we saw your your mug <laughs> with your tea, how how important is it living under the poor for an author? Living under what? Under the poor of your under the poor of your dog. <laughs> Because we, my, we are living dog? because we are certainly living under the paw. So our oh, CEO, your you know. Yes. <laughs> I saw that on your webpage. Um, you know, the living under the paw of my dog. So I have two dogs. Huh. Um and uh, one of them is much more demanding and hmm. surprisingly it's not the alpha dog. The Ooh. the alpha dog, uh, she just sits um and guards the house and wants to be fed and her belly petted. But the other dog, beta dog, is a, is a German shepherd who I think this is her very first lifetime as a, 
a dog because she's scared <laughs> of everything. Um, we're fortunate enough to have an acre and these big birds, these vultures fly over and she looks up and she thinks they're going to, you know, swoop down and carry her away. So she barks at them, but she is obsessed with her ball. Mm. And so any moment when I'm not writing um, or marketing, I uh, am theoretically supposed to be making the ball move. That is okay. my that is my job <laughs> is making the ball move. And fortunately, while I'm outside walking with her or making the ball move, sometimes I get some really good ideas for some of my books. Oh. So I keep my phone with me. And as we're out playing with the ball, sometimes, you know, the subconscious mm -hmm. gets a chance yeah. to work out those thorny problems yeah. about, you know, because when you're outlining or even, you know, telling the story, sometimes I get to, you know, oh, this conflict here isn't quite what I thought it was going to mm -hmm. be when I was doing the outline or, you know, whatever issue yeah. I might come up with and, and out playing with yeah. the dog helps me work yeah. through that. So, uh. <laughs> so I'm under her paw, but, uh, I, I use it to, to serve my needs. Yes. Uh, essential work. Yes. She's yes. Doing and, and for those who, who aren't seeing um, my coffee, my tea mug says dog mom, and it has a number of dog biscuits on yeah. it. So yeah. that's what we were referring <laughs> yeah. to is under the paw. Does will it remain a standalone or have you also plans of writing further books with those characters? That is, it remains to be seen. Ah. Um, once I finished it, I was, I've been trying to think about how to carry it on. And so far that germ of an idea that I can build on has not, you know, there's certainly kind of obvious ways that I could make it happen. Um, you know, some of the ways that people usually carry on like a movie franchise or a book franchise where, you know, the, anyway, um, <laughs> you know, so some of the things that happen at the end, maybe, uh, you know, are revealed to be different than what we thought or whatever, but I hadn't found this book is so special and so perfect. You know, the level of conflict between the main characters, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, I'm having a hard time thinking about how to replicate that yeah. because once you've used that device, you mm, know, yeah. with the, with the two main characters, it's, it's, I'm having a hard time finding something equally as full of conflict. And Cleopatra is also, um, an apex character. So I'm also having a hard time thinking of, you know, something that could be better, but I, I haven't given up on the idea of circling back. So I'm just kind of letting my subconscious work on that. And in the meantime, I had some other idea about a heist novel of all oh. things that, mm -hmm. um, that purely came up from my subconscious and I fought it and fought it and fought it. I was like, <laughs> I don't write heist novels. I don't read heist novels. I don't. And, and yet I had this idea that just would not let go. So I'm about halfway through that book. I've taken a little bit of a break while, Ooh. you know, doing all of the marketing for mm -hmm. Cleopatra, but that one I may just need to finish just because it, it just, it was so funny. I fought it and fought it and fought it. And <laughs> one day I sat down and I was like, all right, fine. Uh, let's just see where this goes. And I outlined the whole bloody thing in six hours. Okay. Now we've talked earlier yeah, about yeah. how it normally takes me like two yeah. months, three months, yeah. six months to mm -hmm. outline a story. This whole thing just went, bleh. it was almost like, you know, I vomited up this, this, <laughs> this outline of this book. And I thought, huh, well, maybe I should write it. So yeah. I've got it about halfway written and it's, It's a story of forgiveness is what it mm -hmm. is. It's two men who just absolutely hate each other mm -hmm. and they get thrown together during a prison escape. Mm. And so it's, it's about, you know, will they kill each other? Will they forgive oh. each other? How's that going to go? Hmm. Um, so sounds yeah. absolutely intriguing. That's another standalone too, probably, or we'll <laughs> see. I've, I've, I don't have an idea. If there's a way that I could carry that one on, but, uh, I don't know. We'll see. One step at a time. And since you are writing and writing and writing, what would be your advice then for all the aspiring authors also out there? Mm. So a couple of bits of advice. One is that you, one of the things that has worked best for me is to hire or have my publisher have developmental editors mm -hmm. because I have a hard time, you know, knowing what I don't know. And it's, 
helpful to have someone in your corner who can put all of the pieces together. So the editor that I'm working with right now, I'll finish the story, but I'll still have these kind of lingering, like it's, it's, it's my subconscious, like knowing that there's a couple of issues with the story, but I can't quite put my finger on it Mm -hmm. or I would fix it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so having an excellent developmental editor in your corner can come in and say, Hey, you, you know, this doesn't really land for me Mm -hmm. and you might consider this or this or this. And it's like, Oh, that's what Mm -hmm. I was trying to come up with, Mm -hmm. but I just couldn't. So having that and some excellent beta readers who Mm -hmm. can give you a variety of feedbacks, Mm -hmm. right? Maybe it's sensitivity readers. If you're writing, you know, outside of your own identity, Mm -hmm. Um, but just having a variety of perspectives before you put it out there, you know, before you publish it. I think that's one thing. Um, And then just be prepared to spend some money on marketing and public relations, because even if you're with a well-known publisher, the level of marketing and PR that you're going to get is far less than what you want. So just put together a budget, save your pennies, you know, work your day job, um, don't quit your day job (laughs) and, you know, save your pennies so that you can uh, launch it into the world um, and let people know that it's out there. So mm-hmm. they can find it. Mm-hmm. And what other future plans are there for you or which you can share with our audience? What can we look forward to? This just not just a heist book, but what else is there to come? Well, I've got some <laughs> ideas for um a fourth Van Ops novel that ah, I'm kind of uh-huh. yeah, I'm mulling around. There's three novels in, in that series so far, and uh readers are are really enjoying that series. So I've got some ideas for that one. That that I might turn to that after I finish the heist novel. Ah, okay. And are there ever any ideas? I'm just asking you because we are we've been talking about it uh, before we came onto the show. Yeah. Um, going more comedy like with your yeah. thrillers, maybe because we were talking about you might know uh, the books by Mick Heron, his yeah. Slough House series. Uh, mm-hmm. They turned they turned I think the first book into a was it Netflix or something in a six six part uh, TV mm. show, and mm-hmm. it's they are really. What we would yeah, it was call a group of misfits. It, they are really, really, really misfits, to say the least. Oh. And it's a more a you know approach which is not too serious, but it turns out they know their stuff. Yeah, <laughs> is it uh, satire or just lighthearted? Mm, little bit, just yeah. It? I mean, the the main character. As it turns out, he isn't bad at his job. He just doesn't give a shit oh. <laughs> anymore because something oh. happened in the past. And since then, he he just uh, makes sure he spends his time, his days in the office and just puts everything in writing and just file it. And that's it. No action, please, because then yeah. you have to get out of the office and so on. Uh-huh. <laughs> That sounds fun. Um, we'll see. I've I've thought about uh, writing satire. My my marketing brain wants to keep me on brand, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. because um, you know I've spent years building a readership for yeah. this type of story, um, and that's part of why I fought the heist thing so mm-hmm. hard. Was it's it's not typical for you know what I'm doing or yeah. or for my for my readers. So I'm sure I will find another set of readers who who like that. But uh, we'll see. You know, never say <laughs> never say never. Yeah. And you know, I I do certainly have some. There's a little bit more lightheartedness in the Van Ops novels than there is. This novel, um, Cleopatra's Vendetta, is is a little more serious. Mm-hmm. Um, Sam, I think, adds some levity, and I really enjoyed, uh, you know, how snarky Angie got sometimes. <laughs> um, so that was that was fun. But uh, yeah, the the Van Ops novels, uh, you know, it's about um, a brother and sister who are twins, and uh, and her boyfriend. You know, they they got pulled into the covert ops world, kind of unexpectedly. They that was not part of not part of the plan. So the first book, The Lost Power, is an origin story for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that set of novels, um, I think you guys would enjoy. It's it's definitely more lighthearted, but we'll see. I enjoy a, a good a good satire now and again. Um, <laughs> so who, maybe who, who knows? knows? <laughs> exactly. Who knows what the muse will bring? <laughs> exactly. And is there anything else you would like our listeners to know? Anything else you would like to share? 
like to share that if they're curious at all about my work, they can download the first six chapters mm-hmm. of The Lost Power for mm-hmm. free in exchange for their email, which I promise to only send them really fun things um, <laughs> and not very often. Uh, so they can go over to vanops.net if mm-hmm. they, and there's some very fun trailers about mm-hmm. Cleopatra's vendetta that they can see at vanops.net. And uh, that redirects over to my avantisentre.com website. But as we know, my name is a little bit harder to remember than just Van Ops, which is V-A-N-S <laughs> dot net. So they can head over there, watch some trailers, uh, download the first six chapters and and see if my work might might resonate with them. So that's kind of what I'd like to, to mm-hmm. leave them with is just thanks for thanks for listening and getting mm-hmm. to know me a little bit better mm-hmm. and head over there and yep. see if they might like my work. They should definitely yeah. because we enjoyed reading your book and look, you. we're looking forward to more. Yep. yep. Definitely, don't we? Okay. So Avanti, thank you for joining us. Thank you for making time for us. It was great talking to you. Thank you. You did enjoy this episode as much as we did? Then hit subscribe and don't miss the next episode. Also, make sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. If you like to support us and buy us a coffee, you can do so via Buy Me Coffee and other platforms. You can find all the necessary links in the description. Until next time.